that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those whom you gave me I have kept, and none of them is lost except the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also may be sanctified by the truth. May God add his blessing for you this word. I encourage you to keep the scriptures open. I'll be referring back to it several times. But Jesus makes it clear his heart is aching for those he loves. He knows what they're about to face. He knows it's going to be hard. He knows most of them are going to be martyred. He knows the world is going to resist the message. Because the world has gone and, and gotten in bondage to sin. And he is the hope. But just like light hits your eyes when you've been in the darkness, you ever gone to a matinee movie, walked out in the afternoon? What's the first thing you do? That's the way the gospel feels sometimes to a lost person. They begin to get very uncomfortable because very, all of a sudden their whole world system, their whole value system feels threatened by a truth that they know not. And so the world resists, and, and Christ knows that. And in his heart, he said, Lord, in verse uh, 11, he said, I'm no longer in the world, but these are, and I come to you, keep them through your name whom you have given me. Now, how's he going to do that? How, are they, how do they hope to hold up? He said, that they may be one as we are. How can it be? Is there any conflict with Christ and God? Most assuredly not. He is God in the flesh. In Him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And His desire, as unified as they are, is that we would be likewise. Wow. Is that possible, humanly speaking? No way, Jose. It's not possible, humanly speaking. Why? Because we all have our flaws. But in the power of the Spirit, it is definitely possible. And that's why it, God's, in the truth for today, God's will is unity in the body. Amen. Now, that doesn't mean that we're always going to agree on everything, but the reality is that a united church these days is an enigma. It's not often seen. Very often there, there are problems that exist, but uh, recently Joe McKeever wrote an article on the Unified Church, and he made the statement uh, point blank that it's uh, uh, just almost an not an oxymoron, but a, uh, an enigma. It's a rare thing, an anomaly, to see a united church in our day. Most of the time there's some pulling, there's some tension going on. Now that works fine down at the legislature. They got a little pulling going. They'll always have some pulling going on down there, right? Mm -hmm. That's why we send fiery little lawyers down there to <laughs> straighten them out. <laughs> <laughs> They'll always have. But you know what? That's not God's will for His church. That's right. And it never was. But a unified church, he outlined seven characteristics. He said a unified church will have problems, but has people in place to deal with them quickly. A unified church must be ever alert to forces that would divide it. That is, that personal agenda that sneaks in where the tail wants to wag the dog. Our purpose is clear, build the kingdom. And we don't, we, I didn't outline some plan we're going to follow. You know why? Because I believe God's way is he's going to send us the people to fulfill his plan. So as he sends people, we look at what their gifts are, what their burdens are, and we work it all into a ministry pie that's made up of the people God sends us. He does the defining. 
We don't lay out a master plan and try to plug people into the parts we think they need to be in. We take them based on their gifts and we employ those gifts and that's why we seek to grow it. A unified church will have needs bigger than their resources. Well, we make it on that one. But has been there before and knows what to do without panicking. A unified church can accomplish incredible works. A unified church is an anomaly. It functions as a veteran unit as though everyone had been in place for years, but welcomes new members into their body all the time. I love that about us. Now, I'm not, I'm not patting ourselves on the back, but the reality is I see that here. Nobody walks in and has to earn acceptance. You come a couple of times, you're here. You're part of it. And when you're not, we miss you. Uh, a unified church reacts quickly and quietly against intrusion from the enemy. A unified church recognizes an alien invasion and knows how to deal with it. And that's talking about, not talking about Martians. <laughs> I'm talking about agendas. Uh, wrong motives. Unified church loves its pastor. I like that. <laughs> Accepts his leadership. I like that. Honors him. I love that. But the unity is based on relationships with Christ not the shepherd. Mm, a unified church is a pleasure to pastor. Now folks, I can tell you there are a lot of times as pastor, not here, but in other situations, I've been in several interims, a couple of permanent situations, you feel like you're walking up a hill with a rope dragging a concrete block. And almost daily that's how you feel because it all falls on you to give the place its life and its dynamic and Keep the people moving. And that's how your life feels. And I guarantee you there are a lot of pastors who feel just that way today. Mm -hmm. But a unified church is not that way. We're mobilized by a kingdom burden. By a love for Jesus, a relationship with Him. Now, you may say, well, we're just a little group. You know why? Because we're not going to apply to appeal to the worldly ways and bells and whistles trying to draw people. We're just going to focus on it's all about Jesus and growing the kingdom and learning His Word and loving each other. And we'll take what God sends us. Anybody and everybody that God sends us. And we'll love them and we'll be there to minister to them. The Unified Church is made up of members looking for ways to serve one another. No dominating leaders, no insecure ones looking for affirmation, just servants. The Unified Church has no executive leaders either. Everyone is a servant. Lastly, a unified church is one when one begins to throw his or her weight around, insisting on their way as the only way, the other members pull back in concert. Once the person realizes his attitude just isolated him from the body, his malignant work stops, dead in its tracks. Hopefully, he comes to his senses and repents. But either way, the church is unmolested, undisturbed, and goes forward. Hmm. Folks, that's reality. That's right. And I like that. That's, uh, that's Christ-like, unified church. So that's, those are some of the characteristics. God's will is unity in the body. Uh, John 14, 27, Jesus said, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Now, in a unified church, there's peace. Anybody like peace? Yeah. Well, I do. I mean, I've known, I've seen homes where there's not peace. I've seen families where there's not, I've seen churches where there's not peace. I've seen governments where there's not peace. I know one rural county not too far away, uh, years ago, this is some 25, 30 years ago, and they had no clue about parliamentary procedure. And they'd have a county commission that nearly get in fights, and one of them would make a motion, and one of them would say, well, I'll make a motion in lieu of his motion. And whoever yelled the loudest the last would be the one they'd act on. I mean, they just stayed in chaos all the time. And finally, one night, somebody said, Mr. County Executive, I make a motion. We start running our meetings by Robert's Rules of Order. He goes, well, that'd be all right. Robert here? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's just total chaos. There's no organization to it. Folks, there are churches and families trying to operate, and some in their individual lives, trying to operate just that way. And in Christ, there's peace. 
Peace is not just the absence of war, it's the presence of justice. Um, Albert Einstein said in a quote, Peace cannot be kept by force, it can only be achieved by understanding. Mm -hmm. now, now, force can bring the absence of war, but understanding can bring real peace. Now, let me just say a couple of things unity is not. First of all, togetherness is not necessarily unity. Um, Psalm 21.9 says, Better to dwell in the corner of a housetop than in a house shared with a contentious woman. Amen. Now, be careful on that one, Brother Johnny. <laughs> what that's talking about, though, and that not, it can be a woman, it can be a man, but in a you see marriages where they may be together, but they're not united. A lot of churches the same way. You know, you tie, you tie two cats' tails together and hang them over a clothesline. They'll have togetherness, but they won't have unity. It won't work. In a, in a, a church where there's not, where there's togetherness without unity, um, there's tensions left to exist. When there's tension, it's, it's not dealt with. It's just left there. Well, let's just now, let's not upset anybody. I knew one church where uh, somebody kicked the pastor's door in because they didn't like that his study was locked. And, and uh, one of the deacons said, well, now just don't upset them. That's just kind of how they are. They wouldn't deal with it. Tension's left to exist. Worship wars. You know, there, are, there are a lot of churches. Some fall out over the color of the carpet. We didn't have a choice. We had to shampoo what was here. Now, I like that. But, you know, but worship wars. I, I've known churches, and I'm sure Lonnie has too, where they get in a big conflict over, oh, what kind of song are we going to sing? You know, we ought to sing just the 1969 Broadman. It was good enough for Jesus, and it ought to be good enough for us. <laughs> you know, I mean, they, they fighting over what kind of songs they're going to sing, what kind of instruments they're going to use. That's not, they might be together, but they're not united. And even if one side seemingly dominates the other, the tension's still there. They don't have unity. Beloved people, do you realize this is not a performance for your amusement or entertainment? Mm -hmm. yeah. This is to lead us in expressing our hearts to God. And we come out of different backgrounds. You know what that means? we got to blend it. Amen. That's right. We've got to welcome a little bit of what everybody is and put it all together mm -hmm. and lift up the name of Jesus. Amen. And, it, you know, we learned our theology as children, most of us, out of the old hymns. We won't abandon those because there's value there. But I think there's also praise of uh, their value in singing to God and not just about God. Amen. Amen. In praise. Mm -hmm. And I'm so thankful for, you know, God's anointed Lonnie. I can't, I can explain it, but I can't figure it all out. But He can. So, you know, no pressure there, brother. No. Just, to, but I, I love the job He's doing with that. I know one worship leader of a small church who uh, had a had a small choir of senior adults, and somebody came to him and complained, said, "I think it's high time y'all started doing some songs like the nuns on Sister Act." <laughs> well, not only was it impossible, it wouldn't have been practical either. But that, you know, some people come at worship like it's for their amusement. Mm -hmm. And it's not. Paul writes in Philippians 2, 2 through 4, he said, Fulfill my joy by being like minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife. Uh, through selfish ambition or conceit, but in loneliness of mind, listen to this, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but for the interest of others. You realize that when Jesus washed the disciples' feet, he also washed the feet of Judas, and later called him a friend. Let each esteem others better than themselves. Look out for the needs and the hurts of others because you know what? There's not a person in this room that doesn't have some baggage. Not one. Well, except Marty. But yeah. <laughs> no, there's not a person here who doesn't. And therefore, we need to grow in understanding each other and helping each other grow 
in a transformation process to become more like Christ. That calls for patience. That calls for a servant's heart. That calls for loving sometimes people who aren't very lovable. And God's going to send some our way. He's going to allow some to come our way. I hope pray we'll always pass the test. Uh, unity is not just the absence of conflict. Unity is not just togetherness. Unity is not uniformity. You know, I, I know I've seen some church groups where, you know, everybody dresses alike. I, you know, unity is not uniformity. It doesn't mean we're all alike. It means our individuality is, ce is celebrated. Look at the disciples. They had fishermen, they had tax collectors, hodgepodge, various types of characters. It shook the world. Why? Because they were united around the cause of Christ. Mm -hmm. And God used each of them's uniqueness. I was in, a, when I was a teen, uh, young teenager, 12, 13, my dad took us on a trip and went to New York City and went to Central Park. And on Central Park, late in the afternoon, there was this one-man band. That's not him, but he was kind of like that. This guy came through. We were sitting around getting a little something to drink and around a fountain in Central Park. And this guy came through pushing this drum and had a harmonica up here on a little wire and had cymbals on his knees and he was beating that drum and blowing the harmonica and boom, boom, boom. And I mean, it was the most obnoxious thing you ever heard. Can you do that again? And, uh, <laughs> no. I'm, that again. I'm already probably going to have that at the video. But, uh, <laughs> but I mean, he was making a racket and you know, my dad, my dad tended to shoot from the hip, and he looked over and he goes, man, I wish somebody just slapped that guy. <laughs> <laughs> and what he did, he'd go around the crowd, and he'd go in circles around the crowd, just right there around the same group, and had his little uh, plate there for you, a bowl mounted for you to drop money in as he walked by. And you know what? People were putting money in. You know why? So he'd go on. So he'd go away. <laughs> You know, they just want to get rid of it. You realize there's some churches that are nothing more than a conglomeration of one-man bands. Everybody doing his own thing, and they wonder why don't we grow. Take that as opposed to a concert. You ever been to a symphony concert? Even if you're not big into classical music, you know, symphony symphonies are beautiful because you've got all these different instruments playing in concert. You realize the verse I read a minute ago, and he said, being of one mind, of one accord, he said, let nothing be done through strife, but um, of one mind, one accord, let each esteem others better than himself. The, the word literally means, and, and of one accord is literally symphonos, from which we get symphony which means all the different instruments playing in harmony. They're all playing something different, but it all comes together. You know, Shane plays bass, Stephen's going to play drums, Lonnie on keyboard, but hopefully they're going to play off the same sheet of music, and it all coordinates, and we sing, and we, you know, I mean, if one of us starts singing Jingle Bells in the middle of Alleluia, it wouldn't go over so well. But yet that's how a lot of people look at their lives in their families and in their church life. God calls us to coordinate those things in symphony, in concert with one another, in harmony. And that only happens if you've got the same agenda, which is to build the kingdom and lift up the name of Jesus. Romans 12, 3 through 5, he said, I say through the grace given and made to everyone as among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, but all members do not have the same function. So we being many are one body in Christ and individually, members one of another. Each body part's called a member. Each part of the church is a member. Each body part has a different function. Each member of the church has a different function. We're not all called to do the same things. 
I'm not technically gifted. I'm glad that John and Stephen and Lonnie are and others. I'm not a children's worker. I mean, you say, well, we're going to let Roxanne preach today and Brother Steve's going to work with the kids. I mean, you come back there, they don't be hanging on books. <laughs> and I'd probably be in fetal position over in the corner, you know. Just <laughs> not gifted for it. We each have our gift areas. Ron is a teacher. Some sing. Some serve in other ways. Some do the cleanup work. We're all gifted to do various things, but when it all is in symphony, I'll tell you, it is the will of God. Yeah. And God is pleased. In unity, there's joy. Verse 13 of our reading today he said, Now I come to you, and this is Jesus speaking to God. He said, These things I speak in the world that they may have yeah. my joy fulfilled in themselves. Psalm 133 once says how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It's not the absence of conflict, by the way, but conflict is dealt with swiftly and with a goal, a goal not of winning, but a goal of healing, a goal of restoration. And when it's dealt with in that way, there's joy. Unity strengthens in difficulty. You face difficult times and you've got unity, it, it's, it strengthens. In verse 14, he said, I've given them your word and the world has hated them because they're not of this world, just as I am not of this world. Folks, when there's unity, there are going to be those who resent it. And one reason they resent the joy they see in you is because they don't have it. But there are those who are going to be drawn to the Father through it. And when we're not on the defensive, but we're ready to show them that love and the reason for it, we can further the kingdom. It strengthens in conflict. Uh, when Peter and John were, were uh, beaten and finally released, and uh, they came to their brethren, and the brethren prayed, prayed together in Acts chapter 4, they said... They prayed to the Father. They said, Now look on their hearts and grant your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. See, they didn't pray for God get them because they mean to us. They prayed, Lord, give us boldness. In unity, it's strengthened because in, in the conflict... Unity leads to an openness to the transforming power of the Word. Verse 17 this morning, Jesus said, Sanctify them by your truth. Your Word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I've also sent them into the world. As for their sakes, I sanctify myself, that they may also be sanctified by the truth. Sanctified means set apart. Transformed. And unity there's a transforming power. We, we sat in Bible study hour this morning, and I tell you, I heard a lot of transparency from some of our people. Well, I'm struggling with this, and well, I'm struggling with that. Hey, you know what? Don't go to anybody. Say, Who says what? They won't tell you, and they better not. They should not. This is a safe place because there's unity. And in that unity, there's transparency. And in that transparency, the transforming power doesn't work in lives. That's how it's meant to work. In Acts 4, 31, when they had prayed, said they the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. Now it says, the, and here's, the, here's the key, here's why that happened. The multitude of them who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any